Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? I guess I can't ask the online participants, but I see there are about 20 people online as well. You can uh, send a chat chat message if there's problem with audio. Okay, so we we have a session to to give you guys a little bit of an update, and I guess for those that are for this is new, then it's a little bit of a background as well on a new um, organizational structure to organize and coordinate the DHS two country support work through the HISP network, uh, something we call the HISP hubs, and uh, I have the three coordinators of each of the three HISP hubs here with me, Kofi, Sorab, and Joan, and they will uh, speak for most of the session. I'll just do uh, two quick slides from the University of Oslo side, kind of coordinating some of this work. We can wait for you guys. Yeah, I think this will be okay. Thanks for joining us. I mean, if you want to go to the AI session, we've rescheduled that auditorium one. Sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think the problem is that the mobile agenda app doesn't refresh uh, unless you force it to refresh but the web version should say auditorium one for ai now. okay so quick quick background kind of what is the hisp network um it's a very important um the regional HISP groups are a very important part of the overall HISP work and uh, kind of the strategy to support countries with DJS2 and build capacity. Uh, we see it from the University of Oslo side coordinating HISP network. We see it, see it as critical to have uh, expert groups available in the region and in country to support governments to build, build capacity and support kind of sustainable information systems. Um, an important part of the HISP groups is that they are there to stay. They work long term with the governments, ministries of health and education. It's not project based. Uh, they are there to stay. And for us, in terms of developing the DHS platform, uh, innovating on the platform, it's also important to have technical experts close to the users in the field that can uh, come with new requirements, test out new innovations and also report back to the, the global software developers that we are coordinating from University of Oslo. Um, and the HISP groups are an important part of that process. Um, and as we know, it's very difficult to solve problems uh, remotely. Uh, developing software, you need to be close to the user, to the user context, and having HISP groups all around the world in the countries where DHS2 is used helps to solve problems locally, and then to be able to share that back uh, to the developers, but also share it with the other groups and other countries. And the HISP groups are kind of a glue in that network community of sharing innovations across countries and across regions. Uh, the HISP groups have now also over time been kind of endorsed and supported by uh, many global investors that invest in the DHS2 platform, that invest in DHS2 country support, and it's kind of been formalized as a support network for ministries of health. Um, and in order to kind of make sure that we, um, we collaborate well, that we uh, agree on kind of core principles and approach, uh, all the HISP groups and University of Oslo sign an MOU, where we kind of sign to and commit to core principles on how we support countries, making sure that we build capacity within the governments, we go for integrated systems, uh, use open source software, uh, and promote sustainable systems. And are not kind of building dependencies on consultants or, or that kind of kind of consultancy model. Yeah, all this available on our website, and there's a link here when you get a slide deck, so you can read the kind of full set of those shared values and principles that all his groups are there to. So there are now 21 groups. Um, it, it keeps growing. We have we had a new group in Zimbabwe last year. There are two new groups uh, this year, Mali and DRC. And there are a few more kind of in the making. So you see all the groups listed here on the right. They're also listed on the dhs2.org website. And there's more information on the kind of HISP network model on that website. I think what's common uh, among many of these groups is that um, they have 
key members in those groups and, and sometimes the leader that has been through the kind of PhD program that we run from the HISP Center at the University of Oslo. Um, and many of these groups uh, have MOUs or are even based at local universities. So that's strong link to long-term capacity building that we also talked about in the plenary session with several countries yesterday morning. Okay, so to the today's focus on the regional HISP hubs. Um, as you saw, there are a lot of HISP groups. Uh, there are a lot of countries, of course, using DHS2 now. More than 70 ministries of health use it for the kind of national HMIS platform. So there's a lot of country support to coordinate. Um, and together with Global Fund, we agreed to try to decentralize this coordination down to the re uh, three regions, Southern Eastern Africa, Western Central Africa, and Asia. So that's the kind of the concept behind the three HISP hubs. Uh, and the initial scope was to help uh, coordinate the TA that Global Fund is providing um, in this current uh, three-year uh, funding cycle. So uh, as I said, there are three HISP hubs and the legal entities that are then con contracted and coordinating that work uh, are HISP Uganda for the East and Southern Africa, it's HISP WCA for Western and Central um, Africa, and it's HISP India coordinating the Asia and doing the official contracting with uh, Global Fund. But the management and coordination is done uh, in partnership with all the groups in the region uh, through a steering committee process. Um, and on the right, you see some of the key activities, and, and Joanne, Kofi, and Sora will talk about this in a second. Uh, but it's about, as I said, First of all, coordinating and implementing the Global Fund funded TA um, on DHS2 country support. Uh, they also coordinate and run the regional DHS2 Academy program. And they facilitate and, and um, build activities across his groups in the region on internal capacity building and collaborating on kind of sharing innovations across the region. And this is not only designed for Global Fund, it's also a model that can be built on. Uh, there are already some examples in Asia with UNFPA. I think having a strong legal entity uh, that can take on regional global contracts for country support and help coordinate that um, is something that can be leveraged by many, many DHS donors. Yeah, so I think I'll stop there and then over to the... You start coffee. Yeah. Well, thank you, Una, and thanks, everybody. Okay, uh, just to recap a little bit uh, how we manage TAs across the hub. Uh, we have uh, started with um, a non-demand uh, way of uh, functioning, but we decided that it was not the most efficient way to conduct our TA. So we decided to conduct a kind of comprehensive assessment of the system uh, of DHIS2 implementation in countries that we are supporting. So we conduct that uh, maturity profile, and this is guiding now 85% or more of our TAs that we are conducting. This maturity profile helps us understand what is ongoing in the country regarding the foundational aspect, regarding the aggregate data, and regarding individual data, what are the challenges regarding governance, getting capacity building and so on. So from these understanding, we have designed a, 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 lot, a couple of TAs that have been currently financed uh, to the Global Fund, but also to NORAD, to Gavi and the other uh, partners. So once we have identified those TAs, they, they have to be approved with the country and then with the, the donor. And we can implement it at stage three. And once it is implemented, we have an internal and uh, a joint uh, uh, quality assurance process which help us First, the, the, the client that has been benefiting from the TA, the MOH will assess and say, I'm satisfied with the, 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 the work or not. And if they are not satisfied, that, then we'll ha we have to go back and then complete the work in a satisfactory manner. And then we have another la layer of satisfaction, which is about the hub, and the hub will conduct a uh, uh, quality assurance review to make sure that the standards that are 
out there in the hub uh, has been respected during the TA conduction. So this is the, the process through which we manage our TAs and everybody is welcome to join so that we can continue that good uh, process and lesson learned from this process. Just a quick overview on the maturity assessment, as I was saying, uh, you can see that figure, which is the, the main output after we have conducted um, maturity assessment. You can see the three uh, domains uh, from the bottom to the, uh, to the top, you have the foundational level and then the aggregate data and the tracker uh, data. So you, you grade, you kind of assess each of those components and then you can come up with a, a kind of a figure. What is in red is not achieved, it's at uh, early phases. And then what is at uh, early progress is in orange. What is adequate, you need some more adjustment is uh, adequate. And then what is mature, you don't need anything there that is in, in green. So with this just figure, you can have a broad idea of what is happening in the country uh, regarding DHIS2. So we have done this in more than uh, 30 countries now, and then uh, we're continuing uh, to do it uh, in some more countries. What are the main strengths that we have found across all of those countries? First of all, we have strong aggregate data in most of these countries. And this is something we need to appreciate. Well, I was saying that it was more than 70. We have counted it. It's more than 107 countries now. Uh, so strong aggregate data and a huge appetite for uh, data and digitalization in general. And then uh, beyond HIV, TB, and malaria, we are seeing some new interest in some other programs like in mental health, in non-communicable diseases, in enhanced surveillance and one health. But also we have noticed some gaps that are common to the countries. First of all is the country capacity building, not, in, not just to build the capacity, but also to help sustain them in the country. So this is an appeal to the donors community to make sure that we are working together to sustain the capacities in the country. Metadata quality is also a challenge because uh, what the, the kind of data you have about uh, in your system depends on the quality of your metadata. And we have been uh, conducted a couple of metadata uh, review and cleanup so that we can improve the data quality. Server management and data security was also a challenge. We have started DHIS2 with aggregate data and nobody was concerned about uh, security. Now we are moving towards more and more individual data. Then we have to secure individual data. We have to make sure that privacy is guaranteed. So this is a whole work we need to do. And we're also advocating for more support on that. And also digital strategy document that were available out there. A lot of countries have them, but people are not using it as a reference to fund the, to the implementation, to make sure that we are aligning our uh, implementations and support. So we need some more alignment in the country strategy, some more coordination so that we ensure that we are not uh, kind of breaking the system into pieces, but we are const uh, constructing it in a robust way. So I will turn it now to uh, Joan to, to continue. Joan. Uh, all right, thank you, Kofi. Um, so um, the next stage we're going to look at is um, across the hubs. These are the things that we noticed uh, that we generally have in common. Um, the priority, as we were doing these uh, DHIS2 maturity profiles, there were some priorities that the ministries of health kept on you know, reaching back to us and giving us feedback on. And so as we've listed there are the priorities that we got like across the hubs that are in common. So the first one being a need for in-country capacity building at the ministry level uh, and ag across different subject matters, but really uh, going down and more granular uh, to the district level to really make sure that um, all the teams are very well trained in uh, DHIS2 use. Um, the, other, the other priority that we got was a need for DHIS2 version upgrades, just really to be able to take advantage of the latest, uh, the latest features, 
and also to take advantage of the support that uh, we get from um, UIO. Um, the other one was a need for metadata cleanup. Uh, we found that there are very many cases where the, met the metadata was very disorganized and as, and as such, uh, the results that we are getting were not really aligned to what uh, was being input, garbage in, garbage out, you know? We say that uh, very often. <laughs> we are very flattered by all of this. Okay. <laughs> it's good to know it's popular. Um, <laughs> Okay. So, and then, <laughs> can you put a stop on the door so that you can? I think I can continue. Yeah. So there's also, <laughs> there's also been a, a huge appetite for the for the standardized uh, WHO uh, packages for HIV, malaria, and TB. And as Kofi mentioned, that uh, as we conducted this exercise, the rest of the programs kept on asking us, what about us, what about us? So um, I think one of the major results of this uh, maturity exercise is getting um, all the different health programs to to be more interested in DHIS2 and what we can do uh, for them. Another thing that also came up was a need for integration with different systems and also and, and interoperability. Again, maybe with um, you know stock management systems, with uh, uh, the financial systems and things like that. That was a very uh, important uh, issue that came up. Uh, and also uh, for the area of community health information systems, different countries use different community health information systems. And that was, um, again, something that came up. Another very important thing that I would like to draw attention to is the issue that of guidance on security and data privacy. Um, the HIS groups play a role um, in this in the, um, in this case, the his groups play an, an advisory role to the government sometimes, uh, saying that these are the best practices in terms of uh, security and privacy and what what um, what um, you know policies, guidelines, SOPs can you put in place to make sure that the Ministry of Health is in line with what the national uh, policy is. So that uh, that I think has been a, a new an emerging area that is very important that we must not ignore. Um, yes, and then finally, uh, in all of our regions, we are not traditional English speakers. So many of us speak French, Portuguese. Uh, in Ethiopia, we have, uh, you know, a completely Amharic, yeah? I hope I pronounced that well. And, uh, you know, different uh, calendars. And so there is a need to really adopt a lot of our training material to suit the, lo the local context. And uh, yeah, so, these are the requests that we mainly came across as we're doing this uh, maturity profiling. All right, so uh, looking forward, what are we going to do uh, all together uh, in the next year? We are going to continue to do uh, the DHIS2 maturity profiles for the remaining countries uh, in the regions. Again, some countries have felt left out because we started with other countries. And so we need to get a clearer picture of what is going on in the regions in order to have more targeted um, interventions. And then the second thing is that we use these maturity profiles to bring all our partners together uh, on the same table and to have discussions and to have an integrated approach. So for example, uh, before, I think it's unprecedented that we've never had an opportunity to talk to TB program, the partners in the in TB, in malaria, in HIV uh, at once and uh, discuss the, what, what are the issues that help us to have better data and better quality data, better data usage and things like that. So um, we are using this maturity profile, the HISP groups are using this maturity profile to open up these discussion points. And then uh, the last part is um, we need to have a very, uh, a more formal and a more uh, a more established procedure for how to share these profiles in 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 uh, in one place. Uh, it's been different for different countries. Uh, some countries, you know, just simply email and then it will be viewed. Um, for other countries, we've had uh, you know discussion like a, a formal sort of setting where we went through the profile together and then also discuss the results afterwards. But I think for us as a, as a, yes what we need to do is to just you know regulate that and have it uh, done 
across uh, the across the regions. So thank you. I'm going to hand over to my colleagues. Thank you, Yeah. yeah. So thanks, Joanne. So yeah, the next two slides are looking at the key achievements uh, across all the hubs and how do we move forward from here, uh, bringing more improvements. Uh, so I think for the last couple of years, we uh, organized capacity building workshops across the his groups uh, where all the um, Southern East Africa Hub, the WC Hub and Asia Hub did a lot of trainings within their groups on DHS to maturity profiles on WHO packages, carrying out metadata assessments, and also some sessions on DHS to app development to build the internal capacities of the his groups, which are part of the hubs. Uh, his Asia Hub organized the, the first ever DHS to regional conference where we covered a lot of uh, topics and introduced WHO packages for HIV to malaria surveillance. And we got a lot of country representatives representatives who presented their country implementations on different uh, uh, national programs and uh, it was a good experience for uh, ex sharing experiences across the uh, countries in the region. Uh, each of the hubs had their annual steering committee meetings uh, at the end of the year, uh, which was kind of a unique opportunity for all the his groups to sit at one place and discuss their uh, achievements, their challenges and the strategies for the coming years. Uh, and then we also did uh, a regional level one, level two academies, uh, both for his groups and external participants on different topics. Uh, so how do we move forward? Uh, so last week uh, we had the opportunity to sit together uh, and we uh, the hubs decided to create a technical working group who would be supporting the new his groups which are coming up in the region. Uh, just to recap that when the hubs were being created, uh, Global Fund helped us in doing a, uh, LF assessment where uh, these uh, the leads of the his uh, hubs they were assessed on their governance uh, ME accounting and financial practices and that gave us a lot of insights into how to improve uh, the organization's capacity to uh, strengthen these areas and now we'd want to uh, impart those learnings to the new members the new his groups are joining so this technical working group will work on creating uh, specific guidance material and organize webinars for these his groups which are up and coming so that they can strengthen their project management capacities, uh, technical capacity and documentation, uh, managing their organizations, uh, doing self-assessments. So uh, the hubs have also developed an internal HISP self-assessment tool, which basically uh, analyzes the capacity of the HISP, uh, HISP group functions uh, for uh, project management, HR, uh, accounts, finance, so that they know that what are their weak areas which need to strengthen and then the HISP groups can come together. The hub leads can strengthen those areas by giving apt guidance. Um, we're also looking at uh, uh, how these his groups which are up and coming who can establish uh, and strengthen their collaboration with the university networks to give them more credibility and more work opportunities also uh, kind of uh, that brings up more capacity building experiences as well. Uh, we're looking at uh, putting into place some regional resources for uh, uh, specific domains, health, servers, uh, surveillance, education, where the hub resources can work with multiple health groups and the resource can be shared across the groups working in the region. And uh, we uh, are also looking towards leveraging the his hub model, which was set up uh, with the support of Global Fund, but then we want to reach out to other partners and follow the same practice that we did in the Global Front project. So we have some examples uh, when we discuss the Asia Hub, how they've used the same model with UNFPA in the Asia region. So I'll hand it over to uh, Kofi now to just give a quick review of the activities by each hub uh, in the last couple of years. Thank you, Saurabh. So uh, getting back to what each hub has been able to accomplish over these years, so in uh, just a quick uh, presentation of his West and Central Africa, um, uh, it's hosted in Togo and uh, currently uh, coordinated as a student committee chair by Adolf Kamungunga. He's the second, uh, I can say, coordinator of the um, student committee. We love transparency and peaceful transfer of power in our hub. So uh, by the end of this year, another 
one who is going to take over and then conduct for one year. So the members are Nigeria, Mozambique. Mozambique is the is Mozambique the one that is supporting Portuguese speaking countries within West and Central Africa, including Sao Tome and Principe, uh, Guinea Bissau, and uh, uh, Cabo Verde. But as Ula said, just uh, some more are up, upcoming, like his Ghana, like his Mali, his uh, DRC. So we'll be welcoming some new members uh, in the upcoming years. We, co we cover now 28 countries, uh, as in the list there. Uh, you will have this like this. Then, <laughs> Something went. Sorry. Marcus. <laughs> Um, first can pass the 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 Okay. Okay, we're back. Thank you. So we have conducted now the maturity assessment in 19 countries. You can see them all in the screen. And uh, if you want to know more about those results, you can reach out to us and then we'll direct to the country because the country can share this document with you. And we can have a deep understanding of what is going on in this, this country in terms of uh, DHIS2. And we have a couple of recommendations as well and budgeted activity, uh, high level budget that you can see and that you can use for your planning. And we're happy to, to give you some more information about this. In, within the hub, we have been able to conduct uh, 15 TAs now. Uh, including trackers in Benin, Burkina Faso. Uh, TBDRS is one new one that was conducted by um, his Rwanda in Burundi. Is a drug resistance survey that is all digitalized in DHIS2. Bednet campaigns also interoperability work and uh, DHIS2 assessment. And by the way, we have been able to conduct in Cameroon, DRC in Gabon, whole DHIS comprehensive assessment and design a three years plan for this country. You can even have it if you want to. And uh, we have some more upcoming trainings uh, and TAs, uh, as uh, you say, and Joanne was saying that we have some translations work as well that has been done. So I'll turn to Joanne so that you can continue with his C. All right, uh, so back to us. Um, so um, our, our hub lead is uh, HISP Uganda and uh, our current uh, steering committee chair is uh, um, from HISP Mozambique, Dr. Emilio. Yes, the, yes, the famous <laughs> Portuguese interpreter from this morning. And uh, we have the most HISP groups in the region, nine. And I think we cover the most areas also, 29, 20, 29 countries and uh, speaking three languages. So you can understand the degree of complexity, um, especially considering that the geographical size, if you think about countries like Ethiopia, like Mozambique, uh, like Madagascar, like uh, Angola, uh, the Somalia, these are really big countries. And uh, even, I'm sorry, um, Sudan as well. These are really big countries and South Africa also. Uh, these are really big countries and uh, the needs there are very complex and uh, we can discuss in more detail after this. So um, for us in the past year, we also completed uh, maturity profiles in the following countries. And as you can see, we are, they are both these in Portuguese, there's in English um, and, in, uh, and in French as well. Uh, another focus that we had this past year was uh, supporting the DHIS2 um, academies. Um, this, these were done in Tanzania, in Uganda, and in Rwanda, two academies in Rwanda. And the thing to note was that there was an unprecedented attendance, both in terms of numbers and also in terms of regional representation, we were able to bring staff from the HISP groups in the region to attend uh, these academies. 
And uh, also we had people from very many different backgrounds. Uh, we had people from ministries, we had people from different partner organizations. And uh, this kind of, um, you know, cross, uh, this kind of um, associations bring about opportunities for people to discuss how DHIS2 is used in very many different uh, scenarios. And I think it really enriches uh, the experience for, for their participants. Um, we had also training for the DHIS2 experts in priority areas. So that is really the HISP staff uh, in Malawi, in Uganda, and in Rwanda. Um, again, this is the first time this is being done in the region, and we are really proud about that. Um, we completed uh, technical assistance in Comoros, Sudan, and Eritrea. Uh, again, these are interesting cases because they are complex countries, um, and uh, they were really around um, uh, DHIS to upgrade and supporting for developing HMIS tools, doing training, and doing uh, server upgrades. And um, what we are doing is we are completed planning for the next stage of uh, technical assistance. So right now we are in the process of discussing directly with all the HISP groups in the region um, for uh, you know the technical assistance that will be done and uh, yeah, budgeting it and just trying to make sure we set up and get it done as soon as possible. So in the next year, um, they, we want to complete uh, this maturity profiles in the following countries, uh, in Kenya, Tanzania, Zanzibar, Madagascar, Botswana, Zambia, Eswatini, Seychelles, and Reunion. We want to continue to do, to support the DHIS2 academies, both um, uh, for the facilitators and for the attendees. And again, we want to stay with that regional focus and making sure that we have as many people from the region attending. Um, we also want to focus on growing the HISCO. And what do I mean by that? Uh, we want to make sure that we have as many young people coming through learning about DHIS2. And so that we have um, you know, a huge pipeline of younger people who are interested in, in, in developing a career in uh, you know, implementing DHIS2. Uh, another thing that um, uh, Surab mentioned earlier on is uh, the need for internal HISP group capacity. Um, now, um, how are we intending to do this? Really through peer support. Uh, some of the HISP groups have been in existence for more than 10 years. Some of them are bigger than others. Some of them have um, you know, more domain knowledge. And so we want to focus on um, you know, really peer support and sharing knowledge across both the HISP groups and also across the regions. Um, uh, in the next year also, we want to complete a TA in those countries. Very many, it's a very long list, but uh, well, I think the HISP groups are up to the task. Um, and the TA is really around those areas that I had mentioned before, starting with a, a metadata cleanup, um, a, a DHIS2 upgrade, um, server configuration or setup, and maintenance. A thing that keeps coming up over and over again is the issue of the core team capacity building. And there is a very, very um, you know, deep need for that. And also the issue of uh, governance. Uh, supporting the ministries uh, through advising on policies, developing guidelines and SOPs, and not stopping on developing them, but making sure that they are cascaded throughout the, the ministry down to the lowest level so that the so that the, the entire the entire ministry and the entire country understands why doing certain things is important. Um, Kofi mentioned the issue of security and uh, and also, I think uh, Surab mentioned the issue of interoperability between different systems. Another thing that uh, maybe someone has, uh, people haven't mentioned yet, is the issue of data use. Um, we don't just, uh, you know, generate data just for um, for entertainment. It's supposed to be ultimately used. And I think that all of us have this vision of data being used by different people at different levels. And so, it looks different in different countries. Some people. Uh, we we for some countries we got uh, requests to have things like um, public dashboards, uh, public dashboards, and the content of those public dashboards we are still yet to discuss. But um, then also the issue of push analysis, so that uh, management can be able to see at least maybe a weekly, uh, daily, or you know monthly basis, you know certain key indicators that will help them make those decisions. So data moves away from being something that is is um, you know held only by the HMIS unit 
but is owned by everyone in the throughout throughout the nation and i think that's a really important uh, thing another thing that uh, we have to also be mindful of is the issue of uh, the fact that we need to do emergency support sometimes in our countries and so we need to to keep uh, first of all people and resources available so that uh, when certain political instabilities happen that we are able to respond to the needs of um, the countries as, as his groups yeah and then there was the last thing that um, I think it's impo is important that um, what happens after the TA is completed because we have already done a maturity, assess a maturity assessment slash profile. We've already identified issues. We say we are doing the one, two TAs, but we have created an appetite and this appetite needs to be fed. So while um, right now we are not able to support all the technical assistance uh, requests that have come up, I think the challenge then goes back to all our partners all together that how can we support the other issues that the countries have identified and to make sure that this is sustained and consistent support uh, through the years so this is it for me thank you very much back to Sorab for this pleasure thank you so quick uh, review of the activities that we did and the structure. So HISP India is leading the HISP Asia Hub. We have members from Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, and India. And these are a list of countries in the region that we're supporting and that keeps evolving over time. Yeah, so we did uh, the DHS2 maturity assessments in six countries. A uh, couple of them were uh, complex countries due to their current political scenario, uh, but we were able to do we were able to engage the, the ministry and the HMIS units there to help us uh, get their assessment and their TA needs identified. So Myanmar and Afghanistan were the two complex countries. And then this was followed by Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Pakistan, and Nepal, where we had the support from the HISPIO team to do the assessment and share the outcomes with uh, the HIS group. Uh, we organized two regional tracker use academies uh, along with webinars, which focused on COVID-19, HIV, TB use cases, implementations in the region uh, in 2022 uh, we did the conference and we are planning uh, the uh, annual conference again in november 2023 and also a uh, regional android academy in uh, december 2023 uh, we had a his group expert internal training in vietnam in year 2022 uh, where we had health and technical implementers from all the his groups in the region participate and learn more on dhs to app development and the latest updates in the DHS2 software. Uh, so a quick re recap of the TA items that we're doing at present. So we see that in Asia, there is a, a mix of um, a TA requests where we have the version upgrades and metadata assessments, which kind of top the list. Uh, but then the countries which have uh, kind of a more stable uh, aggregate implementation, they have more needs towards the tracker. So Myanmar, Afghanistan, we focused on the version upgrades and building capacities. Uh, we see that there are some countries where uh, the reporting rates have uh, typically gone down because of political unrest. So there are some specific TS to uh, make the data completeness and reporting back to the acceptable levels, uh, like focusing on Myanmar. Uh, Pakistan, we are looking at doing the WHO dashboards implementation for all the three uh, HIV, TB, and malaria programs and strengthen the existing TB tracker implementation. Uh, Sri Lanka is more focused on the method assessments and cleanup since they're long term implementation. So there is a larger need to clean up the metadata and make it aligned to the best practices. Uh, Nepal, we are working along with the UIO team, uh, the health center to do the version upgrades uh, because they have a specific um, Bikram Samvat calendar uh, specific to their regional uh, country needs. Uh, and then we're also doing a method assessment and cleanup exercise for them. Uh, Bangladesh, we are strengthening the uh, uh, existing malaria aggregate and tracker implementations. Um, so just an example of how uh, his space hub was able to use the same model uh, working with another partners in the region. So we collaborated with the UNFPA Asia Regional Office uh, to strengthen the RMNCH uh, program in the region in the six countries which they selected. So similar to our DHS to maturity profile, we built a custom uh, assessment tool focusing on the SRM and CH needs. And those assessments were carried out in six countries in the region, Laos, Nepal, Bangladesh, Maldives, East Timor, and Indonesia. 
and with Papua New Guinea, which is not a DHIS2 user, DHIS2 country, but then still we went ahead and did the assessment of their existing HIS system. Uh, so we submitted these reports to UNFPA and now they're working on dissemination of these reports to the ministries and the RMNCH departments in these countries. Uh, this year we plan to conduct three webinars in the region uh, focusing on uh, data use for RMNCH and data analytic functionalities in DHIS2 along with data quality, how you can enhance data quality and use data quality features in DHIS2 uh, with respect to the RMNCH data. So those webinars are scheduled in the third quarter. And then we're having an in-person training in Bangkok where the Asia Regional Office is inviting members from the ministries of health in the above countries uh, working in the RMNCH program along with the UNFPA team uh, towards the end of 2023. So that brings us to the last slide. Uh, thank you everyone for your patience listening. Any question, comments? Uh, more than welcome. Uh, the maturity maturity assessment uh, for global fund. So uh, how this can be progressed? Because uh, earlier we uh, requested, but they said that there is some process is ongoing. Because in Bangladesh, the progress is a bit slow because of uh, the country, the global health program, uh, sorry, uh, no cost extension, and uh, there is uh, some reprogramming issues. So that's why they don't give us time. So now this is a perfect time to approach. So the maturity assessment, if we want to proceed in Bangladesh, then we need uh, a guideline how do we proceed the ministry. Yes, so I think for Bangladesh, uh, yeah. so Bangladesh, we, we were trying towards having the assessment in place, but then yeah, because of operational reasons, we couldn't do it. But still, I think in the initial slide, we saw that uh, the priority was to have assessments in the NTA, but then we kept 15% scope for covering countries who were had priority needs. So without assessment, they came into the picture. So Bangladesh is there, but then we're trying to see how we can uh, do this assessment for Bangladesh now. I think we had a discussion with the CRO, uh, WHO CRO team also. So they are also interested in getting the assessments done in the CRO countries. So definitely the countries we, which could not cover under global fund, we're trying to put those countries in the region uh, which, uh, in, to be done in coordination with CRO. So definitely we'll reach out to Bangladesh, Timor and the remaining countries to get the assessments done. If there is no assessment done required for Bangladesh, then we can proceed with the remaining PHA assessment. Because we are actually waiting for the assessment to be done and then decide which area we should prioritize? Yes, I think we have already taken your malaria requirements. I think other programs we need an internal discussion to see what how the funds can be arranged, and then also we can get in touch after the session. Yes. I can tell you who they are later on. Any other comment or question regarding the hub? Uh, ah, yeah. We have the big ogre over there. <laughs> uh, mine is just a, a, a comment and, a, a, you know, an addition to what Joan has been presenting for SAFER. Uh, I think one of the biggest achievements has been the capacity around the capacity building for our his groups. Uh, this is something that we used to enjoy in the old days of UIO funding us to go for academies and uh, uh, in the different regions, but um, I think for this past uh, uh, period that we have really implemented this, uh, we have had a lot of his group staff being trained uh, as participants in academies, and also uh, also the collaboration that it has created in the his group for delivering the academies has also been quite great because we have also been able to at least get some funding. Uh, to have uh, facilitators move from one country to another country. The, the biggest challenge that we still face is the implementation uh, funding. Um, uh, I think everybody knows about this. I, I know Michelle has uh, also known about it, but I think it has been one of the biggest uh, um, uh, challenge. Like, you know, you have the TA, but you do not have the implementation. So I can't go to a ministry and, you know, train the server, uh, train them in, into a server or do something with them uh, in their offices. They just want to be out in the field and um, uh, and, and be able to do that. So I, I think um, like particularly for Uganda, they were asking, could there be a way 
the tea can be, you know, stepped up a little bit to cater for some of those, you know, small costs, not to the to the big scale, because otherwise you are going to be sitting there with tea and no work is done, and then they will move over to, to the rest. Thank you very much. Hello. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, number one, I am from the implementer side, so I feel this is very Im impressive. But I think for the, was it the one Joan presented? It looks really big. And I don't know if it can be dissected. Or if it were possible, I think, yes, the support is uh, very important. But again, uh, I wanted to know after um, after the assessment is done, how is the information disseminated? Do the countries uh, tend to get this information and how can it be utilized further? If I am in Uganda, would I know uh, which ones are my areas to be prioritized uh, for support and others? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, as I was saying, the data that has been generated over this maturity assessment is the property of the countries. Uh, we value that and then uh, we discuss with the countries to see how best we can disseminate this data. And they are the one that tells us, okay, do it like this way or that way. And usually when uh, uh, partners come to us asking uh, what's about this country, then we direct them back to the country so then the country can share the data. But as Joan was saying, we are planning to have a kind of comprehensive way of disseminating this. That was the first round of uh, maturity assessment. So we are currently under the review of the tool of the framework, and then we ambition to conduct another round. So as part of this round, then we may have a discussion with the countries and we can ensure a broader dissemination. For certain countries have been able to organize kind of disseminating meeting with uh, the stakeholders. Something like this is being planned with Ghana. It has not been uh, happening yet, but these are the kind of model that we are trying to use. I don't know if uh, my colleagues have any other comments regarding this. Uh, so I would just like to add that uh, for for the Southern and East Africa region, we are. I mentioned that we are privileged to have the most HISP groups. So while we are 29 countries, we have uh, the most HISP groups also, which are nine. And again, also we have French speaking, we have Portuguese speaking. So that means that at least the countries that they support have more um, more attention uh, paid to them. So he, um, Prosper is here from HISP Uganda, you know, can pay a lot of attention to all the needs of Uganda. And also, um, again, ever since we have been doing this, um, we've had opportunities to support each other. Uh, Prosper just mentioned uh, for the last academy that, for example, we had in Uganda, we had uh, facilitators from Ethiopia, we had facilitators from Rwanda, um, from Uganda, I'm trying to remember which other country, uh, but at least we had from five different countries um, facilitating in, in, in the, uh, the academy. So I think that is something that uh, we are really proud of and we want to you know, just continue to do. Thank you. Uh, we have some two or three minutes more. Okay. didn't have time to formulate my question <laughs> uh, but one thing I was wondering about and I've maybe missed this because I'm from the education team so I'm getting a bit more used to the hub work um, one of our biggest donors in education is a global partnership uh, for education and specifically a kicks uh, fund and the way that they organize themselves is into kicks 19 and kicks 21 
and Kix 19 in Africa is all the English speaking African countries and then Kix 21 is is francophone. So I'm just wondering how that works when you have maybe projects that go across the different hubs are there may, many examples of that or is this a very isolated like per hub set of activities or is there quite a lot of unique work that also goes across because there's so much that can be learned of course by working across so like i said didn't have enough time to formulate the question and maybe i missed something because it came late but or is that too complicated because we're still figuring out yeah Uh, so the way in which we operate, we operate, um, it's not a strict law. It's not uh, that you cannot cross this boundary or you will get into trouble if you cross this boundary. Um, Kofi and I, you know, message each other all the time. Zurab and I message each other all the time. You know, we share, um, for example, uh, we did training in Uganda. We shared the details with, uh, with uh, his India. Um, they share details about things like um, documentation and things like that. So over the past two years, we have had very many opportunities to collaborate. So it is, these are, are kind of loose, loose guidelines that keep us together, but they're not like strict laws. And then uh, there are some his groups that are across the different hubs. For example, his Rwanda and, and, um, and his Mozambique, uh, that is mainly due to the language and the fact that there are very many French speaking countries in West Africa um, that they need extra support for and also the Portuguese uh, speaking countries in West Africa, that his Mozambique that's on this side of, of Africa has to you know, go across. But we seamlessly work together and uh, yeah, cooperate on, on uh, those issues. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. We have a question online. Somebody was asking if each country ha can have his own, his group. But maybe I can direct that one to Ula or to our big ogas here, Prosper, Edem. Uh, <laughs> so the, the question was online. Uh, can every uh, or, uh, every country has its own history? I don't know who want to chip in, Abiot, or they have more <laughs> content than me. Ula? I mean, <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, raising a risk group is something very simple. We just go and then you create it. That's as simple as it is. But now the challenge is sustaining it, is growing it. So if you have a purpose and you have a room for growth, for, for being uh, uh, useful to the country and to the, the, the his community, then you are more than welcome. Uh, but now again, is a question of sustaining the his group over time. So on that same, same topic, how then does one become recognized as a his group? Um, take for example, I'm representing the Caribbean and we have created an organization to support you know, these digital public goods such as DHS2 and others. And one of my objectives here is to, is to find out how we become recognized as an official history for the Caribbean. So how does one go about achieving that? Good question. Thank you for bringing it up. I think uh, we can we can talk more maybe in a in a coffee break. But uh, since we need to break in a one minute, I guess. But uh, I think maybe the first point is that I don't think you need to be a his group in order to be a DHIS implementer or to work on a DHIS project or to work with a country, right? I think as I said in the introduction, the his his groups are part of a network uh, that we are coordinating from University of Oslo that are kind of. <laughs> It's not like a global organization, but it's a network of entities that share values, that work together, you know, following the same principles. For example, um, you know, there are a lot of other organizations in the DHS2 community that have more kind of commercial interests or don't necessarily support open source software in the same way. And I think that's totally fine. I think there's space for everyone in the DHS community, but it doesn't mean that everyone has to be in the HISP network, right? So I think that's maybe an important distinction. 
But I think if you agree to the principles and you still want to be part of the DISP network, I think then it's a matter of working together, establish that trust, uh, and then you know we, as we get to know each other and we see that you know you follow these principles and you're willing to sign the MOU, then of course then it's a as a process then we can list you as part of the HISP network uh, on the website so that other people can see it and then we will invite you to to join the different uh, meetings with the HISP groups etc. But it's it's more than just uh, building a business around DHS is also being part of that research network, uh, capacity building network, um, and be willing to share innovations uh, and apps, etc. Right. So I think back to that first point I made. I think it's uh, there's a lot of different partners here, uh, important partners to University of Oslo as well that I hear at the conference. Uh, not all of them are part of the HISP network. And I think for us, they're equally important partners, but different types of partners that maybe serve a different purpose uh, in terms of supporting NGOs and ministries with DHS too. Um, but if you have a specific uh, wish to become it, and then we can discuss, and then let's see how we can partner. Thank you. I think it's three past and it's coffee, coffee time. And I think we had a very short coffee break in the morning. So let's do a full one now. Thank you everyone for attending.